I'm working on a second edition of a, a book I wrote many years ago called uh, Building Microservices. And I'm sort of getting, working through the process of how we find boundaries for, for different microservices. What are the different forces that drive that? And as a result, I've been reading lots of uh, computer science papers from the 1960s and 1970s. So this is, to an extent, a lot of the writing I've been doing kind of condensed down into a written form and we'll just see how it all goes I just this is my way of saying some of these ideas are fully fleshed out so I'd be looking for any feedback people can provide as we go um, so I had that do actually have a new a book that came out end of last year which is a microservice decomposition if you're interested in how you break systems apart do go take a look at that book there's links on my website about how you can read it over at O'Reilly online for free trials all those sorts of things uh, but Kind of what we're talking about really here is, is microservices and uh, why are microservices cool? One of the reasons that microservices are cool is this idea of independent deployability. So this idea that I can go make a change to a service and deploy that service without having to change or deploy anything else. This gives us sort of our faster pace of change, we hope. Um, and so that's really something that's, that's quite important to us as part of, a, a, um, of our microservice architecture. So, um, but for that to work, is I have to change the account service there. I'll, I'll do it again for you. Look, I'll show you how it all works. If I change that, you know, I redeploy a new version of my account service, we see this line that comes from the upstream customer service. So I need to make sure that I deploy a new version of my microservice that I still satisfy any upstream consumers. So, you know, that customer service is a service that's making calls to my service. So I need to make sure that I, I haven't broken that interaction. And so if I want to be able to deploy things independently, I also need to make sure that the boundaries between these services are stable enough to allow for that to happen. So kind of independent deployability requires some degree of interface stability. So if you don't have sort of stable interfaces and can't reason about those stable interfaces, independent deployability is going to be quite difficult to achieve. Now, as we go back in the past, you know, most computing was done on mainframes. Uh, we had a very small number of big computers. I say we, I did do some work on Kix mainframes many years ago. I do not remember anything about it, so I cannot help you with your problems. Um, but, you know, we, this, is, this was our world. Very small number of very large and quite expensive computers. And so all of our software was running on these things. And as over time, our, pro our uh, programs got bigger, they got more complicated. And we realized that we need a way of kind of bringing order to these larger and these growing programs. And this is sort of where we started looking at the area structure programming and sort of the idea of modularization of our software. So take your big application and break that down into lots of different modules and where we can have sort of clear lines lines of communication between those modules. But these are all running on the same computer, um, on the same mainframe in the old world nowadays on your laptop or wherever else. So your code is packaged into these individual modules. Uh, this allows for a degree of independent working. I could do some of the development and test around module A. You could do some of the development and test around module B. We still have to kind of link those two things together to deploy the software. Certainly that's how most modern modular based software um, platforms work and Erlang's an exception. Um, these modules also they become a, a, an element of reuse. Potentially I could take module C and use that in a different program running on a different mainframe somewhere else. Now of course in modern parlance when we think about modules they can be quite weak concepts so we can think about these as simple as something like a, a package or a namespace um, but all you know especially if we're looking at maybe reuse we would take those modules and package them as their own entities. So they'd end up as things like NPMs, gems, and jar files, et cetera. And we mostly think of modules in a lot of our modern runtimes purely as a way of reusing code, whereas actually what they were really about was about how to organize and arrange code in such a way that you can efficiently work on those systems. Um, I think the problem is we haven't been very good at defining those module boundaries or maintaining module boundaries when it's our own code. Um, now, you could definitely argue, and I've made this argument, that microservices are just a different form of modular decomposition. The difference is that rather than the communication between those modules being on the same process, on the same computer, the communication between those modules is now happening over networks. So um, network calls rather than in-process calls, which brings all the inherent joy of working on a distributed systems. Uh, we also have the fact that the modules 
are typically also running on different computers. Our microservices run on different computers. We've kind of moved the, the economics of computing has shifted us away from a small number of big machines to a big number of small machines, which is why we have service oriented architectures and things like that. So we now have these things on running on different computers that allows us for uh, further um, isolation, uh, gives those teams more autonomy, uh, can also potentially limit the impact of failure if we do these things well. Um, and so we get a more independent deployable uh, world if we run these things on separate computers, because this is the world we now operate in, not mainframes, but hundreds of physical computers, thousands, hundreds of thousands of physical servers running on the cloud, for example, which in turn, we turn into VMs, we break them up into lots of VMs, and then inside the VMs, we put containers. It's like a Russian doll type situation. So now we've got you know, millions and millions of runtimes, whereas before we had a very small number. So this is sort of where we are in the world. So going back, looking at those early days of sort of structured programming, there's been some kind of key pieces of work that are still incredibly influential today, whether we realize them or not. And I think often are the fact that we're unaware of these pre this prior art often causes us to reproduce the sins of the past. One of those sort of seminal pieces of prior art is uh, some of the work done by David Parnas. And one of his most famous papers was on the criteria to be used in decomposing systems into modules. That was actually published in 1971. Some people say 1972. Those people are wrong. It's published in 1971. I know, I checked. Um, and so in his paper, David Parnas is, it was continuing pre prior work he'd done, is into looking at how do we define what a module boundary is? to make that module as effective and you know, as possible when we think about doing development, the process of making our development efficient. And he, um, the technique he developed or the kind of observation he made is this technique of what he called information hiding was the most effective way of defining uh, a module boundary. We'll, we'll talk a bit about information hiding in, in a minute. Um, Agent Collier actually went back and looked at some of the original work done by uh, David Parnas uh, where he's talking about modules, he literally took those papers, he took out the word module, he put the word microservice in, he read the papers again and said, they all still make sense. So there's a lovely sort of series of articles looking at uh, Parnas's work over on Adrian's website. And in fact, um, uh, David Parnas actually comes back and comments on some of these posts to say, yeah, actually, I think you're right about a lot of these things. It's really interesting stuff. Um, so information hiding in a nutshell, you can think of it as hide your secrets. So if you're practicing information hiding from the point of view of a microservice, that means hide as much as possible, expose as little information as you possibly can. So this will talk about having a very small contract. Don't expose a piece of data if you don't need to expose that piece of data. Expose as few operations as possible. Share as little as possible. The idea here is that if we expose, if we don't expose something, then that thing we don't expose, we can change. Whereas if we expose it and it becomes part of the contracts between our world and the world of another module or another microservice, it becomes part of that sort of link between the two, it becomes part of the connection between those two things. And once it's part of that connection between those two things, we have to maintain stability of that. So once you expose something that somebody uses, it kind of locks in to exposing that ever more. You can't change that thing easily other, without causing problems around sort of backwards compatibility. Uh, another paper done by the Parnas, again, in early, also in 1971, uh, looks at sort of, this is a bit prior art as well, was looking at other aspects of modular design. He made this observation that the connections between modules are the assumptions uh, which the modules make about each other. So if you think about a service, when you expose, say, an API or an event in endpoint, you're saying to the outside world, this is what you expect of me. And so you as a developer working on that service need to make sure that you understand what those assumptions are that are being made of you. What are the things that people think that your service can do? Now, one of the nice things is that information hiding is effectively reducing the number of assumptions that one module has for another. If I only have a very small set of assumptions about what a service does or what a module does, it's much easier to maintain that interface going forward. So here, module B is calling module D. Module B has assumptions about how module D should behave. If I'm changing module D, I need to make sure that I maintain those set of assumptions. So I, I, as if I'm a developer working on module D, I really want to have a completely explicit understanding about what assumptions my upstream consumers have. What is it they're gonna do? Now, if you think about modular-based software, 
we typically have an API. If we think about, say, a module within a process manager, we have an API. We can say, well, this is the interface I'm exposing to somebody else. If I change the interface, I'm going to break an upstream consumer. Now, if all of that code is packaged into a single code base or into a single process, and I'm using a statically typed language, and I make a change to that contract, I might get a compiler telling me that I've broken those assumptions. That's not the same in a services-based world, right? What we're looking for here is we want to help a developer know what can I change easily and what can I not. And if I know explicitly what assumptions my upstream consumers have, then I'm happy. This is actually why I'm a big fan of schemas and having explicit schemas for my communication outside of services. That's really important. And this is really interesting to me that I think a lot of people reacted to the horrors of SOAP and the WS Death Star uh, problem that occurred during the early days of SOA and rejected SOAP through Whistle and also got rid of anything else with schemas in at the same time. The vast majority of the communication I see between microservices is completely schemaless, which is quite problematic because as a developer, you've lost one of those abilities you had to be explicit about what data you expose. Coming back to sort of other work, uh, prior work, we look at the work done around destructured programming. Uh, kind of several works by Edward Jordan and I Constantine um, and other books uh, by Paige Jones, uh, both from the Jordan Press. Um, these books are actually surprisingly hard to get hold of nowadays. Getting a copy of Structured Design, kind of an old secondhand copy of that, will set you back about 80 quid at the moment. And I have not got a lot of money. So uh, I've been, would like to rely on a library. Instead, I've got friends who are photographing pages and sending them to me. Um, uh, so it's difficult to get these books now, but they have got some great and interesting ideas in them. This is where the work done in sort of the uh, early to mid 70s are where we get terms like coupling and cohesion. And these are terms that come up quite a bit in the context of microservices. So we have cohesion. And this is the idea that the code that changes together stays together. Typically, we're looking for strong cohesion. And we want all the code that changes together in one place. If I want to change how invoicing is managed, I don't have to go and change 15 different services. There's a chance I'll miss one of those locations. It's going to take me longer. This is boring. I want all of that code in one place. So I can change it together. So we typically would like strong degrees of cohesion. Coupling is the degree to which changing one thing requires another thing to change. So we're talking about coupling in the context of modules or microservices. It's the degree to which a change in one module requires one or more other modules to change. And coupling kind of has a degree, just like cohesion has a degree. So in general, and this comes for object-oriented systems and our sort of services-based system, we're looking for a low degree of coupling. I want to be able to change things independently. If I change one service, I don't want to have to change anything else. That's how we're going to achieve this idea of independent deployability. But I also want strong cohesion because I want all the code that changes together to stay together to make it quick and easy for me to make changes. Now, you can kind of probably always start to see there's actually a tension and actually a relationship between these two ideas. Uh, and in fact, this, is, this, this relationship between the ideas of coupling and cohesion have been summarized into a thing we now call Constantine's law, although it's a thing that Larry Constantine never actually said. Um, but Constantine's law says that a structure is stable if cohesion is strong and coupling is low. And at one of this makes kind of quite a lot of logical sense. If my, if my cohesion is weak, and the, like, and the functionality that I want to change together is spread in lots of different parts of the system, then I, if I want to change that functionality, I'm going to have to change lots of different parts of my system. So that probably implies I've got high coupling. So low cohesion tends to imply high coupling. And so if I want strong cohesion, I'm probably also I'm going to get loose coupling. And so you can kind of have a vicious circle or a virtuous circle, uh, depending on how these forces are working for you. Um, and, and we'll see those ideas play out in a few different examples I'm going to share with you. Now, cohesion at one level is, is quite straightforward to measure. Coupling gets kind of interesting because people take the assumption that low coupling means or no coupling. And the reality is it's very hard to imagine a, a module based soft system or a microservice based system in which there is no coupling. What we're looking to do is minimize the coupling. Now, there are lots of different uh, ontologies for how we think of coupling in the context of structured programming and modular based software. Um, and there are, lot, there are different models. A lot of them were sort of models defined around thinking about code based relationships. And, and so I'm trying to kind of take some of those ideas and come up with a model that makes sense in the services world. This is my first stab at this. And so we could take a look at the different types of coupling and look at them in the context of a microservices environment and think about 
what problems they cause and how we might be able to, to avoid them. So you'll take a look at domain coupling, tramp coupling, common coupling, and content coupling. And so as we go from left to right, we're increasing the degrees of coupling. And so in general, you know, stuff to the left is, is better than stuff to the right. Ideally, we'd have none, but we always will need some, as we'll see when we look at the very first type of coupling, and that's domain coupling. Um, so here's, here's an example of domain coupling. So domain coupling, uh, which you might have heard of as like a call coupling, domain coupling is a situation where one service needs, does, needs to make use of some functionality that is hosted somewhere else. So in this example here, I've got an order processor and the order processor to do its job, it needs to reserve stock and it needs to take payment. Now it doesn't act, it's not actually in charge of reserving stock. That's actually a, a responsibility that we've delegated to the warehouse service. So I have to go to the warehouse service to reserve that stock. So I'm effectively coupled here in terms of, of, a, of a domain oriented relationship. I need to go to you to get something done. Likewise, I need to go to payment. I don't handle payment. The payment service handles payment. So I go to payment and ask payment to do something. So here we have a degree of, sort of this is fairly loose coupling in the grand scheme of things uh, between order processing and warehouse and between order processing and the payment service. Note that there's no relationship between warehouse and payment. There is zero coupling between those two things. So a change in warehouse should not require a change in payment. A change in warehouse might require a change in order processor, uh, but that's only going to be if we somehow changed our, our contracts in such a way that we've made a backwards incompatible change in functionality. In general, domain coupling is what you're going to have. What you want to do is still try and keep it to a minimum. There's still smells you can look for. So if order processor has lots of domain coupling to lots of different services, that can often be a sign that a service is doing too many things. Um, it can also just be a sign that using, say, an orchestrated based BPM tool or something like that. So domain coupling is at the much more the loose end of the coupling world. Uh, some degree of it is, is acceptable. Um, and, a, and in general, if this is the only kind of coupling you're worried about, you're probably doing OK. Uh, next, we're moving into a weirdly named tramp coupling. I'm waiting for the arrival of a book written in the 1960s, 1976, sorry, that will tell me why tramp coupling is called tramp coupling. Until then, I'm not entirely sure whether or not we should be using this term. And if we're not, I'm going to come up with a better term. This describes a situation where one module or service passes uh, down a data structure to another service just for that service to pass it on to yet a third service. So in this example here, the order processor is wanting to say, send the order off. As part of that, we're required to send a shipping manifest. The warehouse says, I need a shipping manifest as part of this request you're sending me. The warehouse doesn't actually do anything with that shipping manifest. It just passes that shipping manifest on to a downstream service, in this case, the shipping service. It's actually the shipping service that wants that shipping manifest. But we're sort of having to pass data and pass it through the warehouse. So the warehouse might care about the items because it needs to go and someone needs in the warehouse to go and pick those items up but the shipping manifest just gets passed seamlessly on to the downstream shipping service. The problem with this, of course, is if the shipping service decides it needs to change the, how that shipping manifest is done, that could cause a rippling effect. I might now have to update the warehouse because it now needs to pipe through a different type of ship data structure. It's also going to require that the order processor also changes. And this kind of tramp coupling could often cause kind of nasty ripple effects. You see this happening a lot where people have built microservices that are sort of really just like more like data processing pipelines, not really what I'd consider a microservice. Um, I'm still working through the right naming for this and uh, some other examples, but this is, this is kind of idea. We can look at some different ways to solve this problem. One of the examples here is, is on the face of it, looks like really the warehouse is just like the man in the middle in a way, and that rather than going to the warehouse just to go onto shipping, why doesn't the order processor just goes straight to the shipping service. And that, on the face of it, might make sense. And in some situations, would be a good solution to this problem. Um, so that might look like this. So I go to the shipping service and say, ship the package, and here's the manifest. The warehouse never needs to know about the shipping manifest. And that might be a right solution. In some cases, that would be a really good way of solving the problem. In this specific case, though, that might add some additional complexity. You see, effectively, the warehouse code was well, the warehouse was doing a bunch of stuff then it was calling out to shipping and it was doing a bunch more stuff. So the first thing we will have to do now is we have to go to the warehouse, say reserve stock. The next call we do is the shipping service to say, now ship the package. That's where we send the shipping manifest. And then thirdly, we go back to the warehouse and say, right, now remove that stock item. Right. Now, in a situation like that, 
this kind of shift has maybe made the situation, we solved the tramp coupling problem, but we've kind of pushed complexity upstream into the order processor. And anything called an order processor is probably already doing more things than you'd like. And so we may not have actually improved the situation. We've maybe traded off one form of coupling with a different form of coupling and potentially centralizing more logic in the order processor. So another, another way to do this might be a bit more of a subtle change would be to say, well, look, let's just hide the concept of a shipping manifest from the order processor entirely. So effectively, we say a shipping manifest is something that only exists in the world of warehouse and shipping, and we are totally unaware of it. So the order processor, we now provide you know, the postal address and what type of shipping we want. The warehouse uses that information internally to create that shipping manifest. We still get to delegate that work to the warehouse service. It still now handles all the nice inventory stuff. It can coordinate with that shipping service. And we've kind of limited the, the change that we need to make here. Um, so if the shipping manifest changes, it doesn't necessarily cause a rippling effect unless the warehouse also needs to ask for additional information. Uh, but there's still, that, that gives us more ways to control the rollout of that. Uh, imagine a situation where we start needing to take on board customs declarations because we're shipping internationally. Um, we could potentially start off by have, providing a dummy customs um, uh, declaration initially while we, when we roll out a new shipping service, uh, while we're only supporting domestic shipping, and then give the order process a time to provide information about custom declarations before we move on. So we were sort of hiding information in such a way that we kind of mitigate the impact of, of further following changes. Two more forms of coupling we're going to look at. The next uh, is quite a nasty form of coupling. So we've gone from domain coupling, we've looked at tramp coupling. Now we're looking at common coupling. Now common coupling is a situation where two or more services are all making use of the same externally defined um, data. So in this example here, I've got the order processor and the warehouse are both reading country related static reference data out of a, a single shared database. So here, you know, somebody said this is the structure of the database, and in here we've got, you know, the the you know the the, the name of the country, the capital of the country, the three letter short code, the currency they use. Um, and so you actually see a lot of common coupling around static reference data. And in this particular use case, it's, it's not too bad. But the problems here are that a change to that common um, database there is going to cause problems to lots of other upstream services. Uh, you have similar issues of common coupling around shared data structures. So shared memory, uh, shared caches, shared file systems can cause similar problems. Now, actually, the static reference data example is quite benign form of common coupling. I wouldn't worry about it overly because firstly, that the database structure is unlikely to ever change. And secondly, because this is a read only use case, but we can consider much more problematic forms of common coupling. Uh, in this example here, we've got a common order table that lots of different services don't speak to. And there's no real clear ownership of that order table. And so the order processor, it will go to the order table and it handles part of the life cycle of the order. So it says, I'm going to update the order as being placed or paid or completed. The warehouse service comes along to the order table and says, I'm going to set the picking status or the ship status. So now we've got two different services reading and writing from the same table. No clear lines of ownership as to who owns that database, uh, which is kind of gets interesting. And, and typically in these situations, this database is under centralized control and very, very hard and difficult to change. So we've got one issue, which is any changes to that database are going to have this rippling effect. The other problem here is, is where's our logic? Think about the world of cohesion for a minute. And uh, what we've basically got is two different services managing the life cycle of, of a piece of state, in this case, an order. So we've now got code related to allowable state transitions in the order processor and code related to allowable state transitions of the same data in the warehouse. We have to hope that the warehouse and the order processor both understand how to change that data in the same way. Otherwise, we get ourselves in situations where if warehouse is operating in a way that's different to how order processor works, we might find out that warehouse does something to the data, which is viewed as being an invalid state transition from the world of the order processor, and then all kinds of nasty things happen. In general, where you see two different services writing the same table, it's typically a sign that you have a low degree of cohesion in here, the functionality around how an order is managed is spread across different services. So this is often a sign that you're lacking cohesion somewhere else in your system. And of course, if your cohesion is low, uh, is low, your coupling is likely to be higher 
and as it is in this case, because any change to this, the database is going to ripple that change out, but also any change in the life cycle of an order is going to require lots of things to be changed together. So you've kind of got two levels of coupling there to think about. One of the easiest ways to solve that would be to say, well, actually, uh, we could put something, or we could put something in between. So let's look at another example of coupling. This is the worst form of coupling. And this is what's called content coupling. It's also uh, sometimes known as pathological coupling. And this is the worst form of coupling. And this is where you reach into somebody else's data and screw around with it. And it, it's a, it looks a little bit like con, uh, common coupling. Uh, but here with common coupling, there's like an externally defined data structure that everyone uses. In this case, you're reaching into somebody else's innards and messing about with it. So here we've, got an, we've, we've created an order service, the order processor goes for the order service and asks quite politely it makes a request that's why i prefer request to command i like request it requests that the order service make some change happen to the order the order service is able to look at its local state and say well based on what you've asked me to do and based on the current state of my system what you're asking is very reasonable i'm happy to make that change happen the warehouse has gone nah screw that for a game of soldiers and it's gone straight to the database and it's just overwriting data however it feels like so it's bypassed the logic so now we've got we think we're managing these state changes state transition of this data in this effective way in order but really the warehouse has bypassed those controls this is actually worse than common coupling because now if i'm working on the order service if i'm the developer working on the order service is it clear to me what changes i can make what are the expectations of my consumers now, the order processor, I understand what their expectations are because they're using an API or, or some invented endpoint. And I can see what I expose, and that's easy for me to reason about, especially if I've used a schema. But if some outside party is reaching straight into my database, it becomes very difficult, nearly impossible, for me to understand what data they're using and therefore what parts of my schema can change easily. Right? So this is really, really difficult. This is the worst type of coupling. Uh, so this is why reaching someone else's database is bad news, right? Because it makes development more difficult, and it's a much, much stronger form of coupling than even common coupling, which is already pretty bad. And the logic for state transition is kind of now smeared all over my system, which in turn means I've got weak and uh, weak cohesion as well. So that was just a real whistle-stop tour through my current thinking about coupling and cohesion. So just to summarize very, very quickly, First principle you want to think about is information hiding. Hide as much as possible. Anything you expose to an outside party becomes part of a set of expectations that you need to maintain if you want independent deployability. Therefore, don't expose stuff you don't have to. It keeps your life simpler. Then we're into the world of coupling and cohesion. So cohesion is the idea that the code that changes together stays together. We want strong cohesion. We want loose coupling. I want to be able to change one service without having to change something else. We want loose coupling. But when we get into that world, there's different types of coupling. Domain coupling, you're going to have quite a bit of that. That's much better than things like common or content coupling, where you're reaching straight in and grabbing hold of people's databases. Um, so when you find yourself in these situations, think, well, how could I move myself to a more loosely coupled model and also improve the cohesion at the same time? So you know, replacing content coupling with domain coupling is a really big win for you and will make your systems much much easier to work with um, i went quick through a lot of that um, but i did can't turn up late so i do apologize for that so i hope that stuff is an interest if you want to know more information there's lots more information over on my website cool yay thank you uh, so if if anyone has questions, please uh, turn on your sound and feel free to ask. And Sam, thank you very much for joining us. I'm okay. sorry, sorry for those different links that I sent to you. It, it's quite, it's, I wasn't going to say anything on the line. We went, we didn't talk about it. It's fine. Yeah, that was my fault. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and if people would rather ask me questions offline, um, getting me on Twitter at Sam Newman also works really well uh, mm -hmm. if no one wants to ask a question in person. Yeah, Dylan, maybe you have any questions? <laughs> I have one question. Uh, can you hear me? I just switched microphones. Yep. Cool, brilliant. All right. Um, do you have a theory about where Trump coupling gets its name from? 
I've, I've tried thinking about it and some of the ideas I've come up with are disturbing enough that I really want to find out where it came from to know if I can still keep using the term. Because, <laughs> um, you know, I, I can imagine people talking about things like tramp stamps and stuff like that. And I just yeah. want to size up the whole world very easily. It's a very easy language change. No one knows what the term really mean, uh, means anyway. So if I can rename that term, I will get a come up with a better name. I've been talking to Kevin about it, see if we can come up with a better name. So, yeah. and he would know what to call it. I have actually ordered that book that the term comes from. Um, I'm waiting for it to arrive. But yeah, a lot of my thinking about that would quite disturbing so i decided to just <laughs> you know caveat it the term at the moment i'll be i'll be my hunch is being somebody who's who's interested in linguistics is that it probably comes from railroads and uh, hobos traveling on the american railway network yeah. because coupling comes up a lot in talking about railways as well as talking about microservices and so i i'm wondering i'll be really curious to see when the book arrives if it's some obscure reference to a way of connecting railway cars together or something but yeah, yeah. I mean, that could easily be given that could easily be the situation so I, if that is i'm probably going to try and come up with a more meaningful term and, and i'm not wedded to these terms so i'm i'm very out to change them. i've been trying to use terms that have that that, that relate to previously used terms because then people can look at the prior art yeah. And so if I do end up renaming those terms in, um, this is for the second edition of the book, if I do end up renaming those terms, I'll, I'll say what the old terms were so people can look back at the old, at the old yeah. things that were written. There's no point just recreating stuff for the sake of it. You can reuse what's come before. Yeah. No, it's interesting. Really interesting. Thank you. Hi, Sam. I really loved your talk. Uh, this topic about microservices is for me personal, quite new. But I really loved your insight and your Thank expertise you. in microservices. Uh, and I'm really happy that I finally saw a talk from you. Oh, thank you. I saw your name for a long time in the communities and I really was enlightened by your talk. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. I, I, if anyone does want to watch some of my earlier talks, my website's got pretty much, I think, virtually all the conference talks I've done over the last 10 years are available as YouTube talks. And so you can go look at my talk page and, and find information there. So if you happen to be stuck at home and not much to do, I can't imagine anything worse than watching me, but whatever, if, that, if you enjoy that, then, then there is, inf there, I am out there on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in chat, we can see there are lots of thanks for Sam. Thank you, everyone. Talk. So if anyone wants to ask someone personally, I don't know, Sam, will you stay for another talk? Maybe I, will, I, I will be online for at least the next 16 minutes before my next call. Uh, so for the next 16 minutes, I'm happy to answer questions via chat um, uh, while we get on with the next talk. Mm -hmm. And if not, I'll ping me on Twitter and I'll answer any questions on Twitter. Okay, thank you very much.